Kojo 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 Good afternoon everyone So if you're enjoying the sun give us a shout Okay hating the sun give us a shout That's it You know I just wanted to to get this started to highlight the um, idea of polarization and highlight the idea of minorities as we just saw ourselves barely anyone enjoying the sun first of all i want to thank earth for organizing a really critical conversation like this more importantly i'd like to really thank each of you in the audience um given the temperatures out there those of you who are watching us live it is it is fairly warm here so those of you who managed to make it here and are sitting here please give yourselves a round of applause now a quick beginning on how we are framing the convers uh, the conversation today ambassador saab here is as we all know a focus on uh, you know an expert on geopolitics on security issues on international relations um so ambassador sibal today is going to speak uh primarily to the idea of the un unsustainable military models and the aggressive conquest based um diplomacy that has been historically been followed in the west prasenjit basu as you all know is is a famous economist historian um now as as some of you have read one of my articles or and videos that went viral i personally believe that communism is dead capitalism so communism is dead in the grave capitalism is irrelevant to the other 99% which basically means we don't know who capitalism serves um so is there a space where india can provide an alternative model in terms of economic leadership that's that's what prasanjit basu is going to speak about um and pandit ji here although you know when someone called pandit very recently it 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 uh, it went very controversial i hope today we won't pandit ji is going to present the lens of the the indic diaspora based based in the uk not just from an individual level but also from the lens of an organizer that presents the india story within the uk and and to the west so that's that's a broad structure of the format um uh, we will have about 30 minutes of a conversation followed by q and a so please keep making notes i i'd like it to be more interactive today not just from an audience point of view but for for us as well um so let's just quickly get started opening comments from ambassador sibal we each get 2 minutes each and then we move on to the conversation <clears throat> well thank you anurag when we talk about uh, india's role in the emerging global order there is a presumption that there has been a global order i like to describe whatever has existed as controlled disorder uh we after all united nations was set up for what to prevent future generations from the scourge of war and since 1945 how many conflicts have we had and even today we have a major conflict in europe uh the united nations has not been able to Uh, play its role the security council has not been able to do that uh, international law has been violated the charter of the un has been violated so if you want to create a new world order the first thing you have to do is to reform the united nations itself especially the un security council otherwise you won't have any semblance of a new order not that the new order with the reform of the un security council is going to do marvels for the simple reason that the veto power will still be there and the five major powers are not going to accept giving up uh, this veto because this is a shield for them against any possible action when they violate international law the third is that uh, when we now look about look at the world order we shouldn't think only about security you have various kinds of orders of which the, most of the world the, the entire developing world has been a victim you talk take about take the economic order uh look at uh, the, the fact that uh, 
United States by virtue of the fact that the US dollar is the world's reserve currency. Um, Israeli has power which you cannot, cannot easily uh, cope with. And they have weaponized finance today in the manner in which they do and the sanctions that they have imposed, uh, which we have suffered from and other countries have suffered from, because you always fear the consequences of secondary, secondary sanctions on you if you, if you intentionally or unintentionally violate them. Second is the information order. The entire narrative about what's happening in the world is controlled by the West. And I see it, unfortunately, in our own press. I mean, our press is so much supportive of Ukraine uh, as if Russia doesn't matter. And why is this? Because the entire feed that they, feedback that they get about what is happening is through agencies and other channels and is coloring uh, their thinking. And they have no independent uh, voice uh, in this. In terms of the security order, leave aside the United Nations, there is um, the whole issue of multipolarity. Now, India supports multipolarity. BRICS is based on multipolarity. SCO in its own way is based on multipolarity. Uh, can we move towards real multipolarity? It's not a question that can be easily answered today, though I think we are moving in that, uh, in that uh, direction. And, and finally, there is uh, this whole thing about uh, uh, how we uh, cope with the cultural and religious elements that also uh, infuse diplomacy. After all, India is under attack, Hinduism is under attack. Now, why is that? Why is that? And uh, the whole, when it comes to uh, India minorities and this and that, the manner in which we have been criticized by countries who have actually violated the rights of minorities in the past and today, but they are giving moral lectures to us about how we are mishandling our minorities and this and that, on, you know, targeting us for curbing religious freedom and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of work ahead uh, for countries like India to have their place in, the, in a new world order, whatever that means and whatever shape it takes. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I couldn't have seen a more precise and succinct, which one, no one associates these two words with diplomats. So, so thank you, sir, for framing it in, in, in our language, in the sound bites that we understand. So ambassadors have talked about weaponizing finance, Prasenjit. Would you want to shed some light on both the ideas of weaponizing finance um, and in terms of very quickly, the, the two or three global mega trends or mega changes you see and how they might affect India, positively or negatively, but specifically limited to finance and economics, two minutes for your starter and then okay. we engage in the conversation. I think, first of all, it's important to understand that we are very far behind China, which, is, uh, which unfortunately is our neighbor now. Uh, through, most, through all of history, China was not our neighbor. Our neighbor was Tibet. And it's important, first of all, to keep Tibet, uh, at least in our maps, as a separate nation state. It always was. Tibet was our neighbor. And Tibet is part of our civilization. Civilizationally, if you think about Buddhism, Buddhism reached Tibet from Bengal. There was a person called Atisha Dipankar from the Pal dynasty who, who took Tantra and, the, and Vajrayana Buddhism to, to, to Tibet. So, uh, now, with regard to the economy, we are, you know, the, the mistakes of the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s have pushed us back severely relative to, uh, relative to China in particular, and of course the rest of the world as well. So we can celebrate the fact that we are now the fifth largest economy. We should have been fifth largest 20, 25 years ago. Uh, the gap between us and China is so large that we really, as an economy, have to keep our heads down and, and rapidly uh, narrow the gap between us and China in particular, and of course, keep, uh, keep growing faster than the rest of the world uh, uh, for, for several years to come. Now, you know, Ambassador Sybil talked about the fact that the world order, world economic order, is skewed against developing countries. One way in which it is, is if you look at uh, uh, the so-called GATT, the old GATT arrangements, and what now is the WTO, 
it uh, excluded, you know, trade negotiations excluded agriculture, and textiles were driven by something called the multi-fiber arrangement, which is a system of quotas, which kept uh, developing countries from developing faster. And then eventually, India for 40 years argued this case for dismantling multi the multi-fiber arrangement. When it was finally dismantled, all the benefits went to China because we hadn't reformed our uh, labor market in particular to take advantage of the fact that the multi-fiber arrangement had been dismantled. So we have now, in the last two years, supposedly dismantled the old uh, uh, inflexible labor market and int introduced new labor codes that will make our labor market much more flexible. This is really central. But the ironic thing is that this was passed by parliament. It was, uh, it was uh, signed by the president, but it hasn't yet been notified. India is a unique country where laws get passed, they don't get notified. There's one law that wasn't notified for 28 years. I mean, you Wonderful. know, and now this one has, now, the point about this, the uh, reason I raised this, I just quickly just make one point. Yeah, quick yeah, point. Quickly, quickly being the, the operative quick point word. Yeah. Is basically that if you want to think about an example of what is a dharmic economy in today's world, my example of a dharmic economy is Japan. Japan was not colonized by either uh, West Asians or Europeans, and therefore, it has maintained a dharmic so social system and an economic system. And uh, one of the central tenets of the Japanese model was to employ everybody first. And this is where we have missed the boat. I mean, we first of all, I think, as we get going as an economy, the first thing we need to do to emerge more rapidly into this new world order, more successfully, is to create a massive ecosystem of labor-intensive manufacturing. So I'll come to that in a in bit more detail. But that, I think, is the missing element. Uh, Can we China, just move on to China, China exports nine times the textiles and garments that we do. We need to even take half of that market share, and we'll be on the road to wider prosperity. Yeah. Wonderful. Sorry, sorry. So, so guys, I, I just want us to get quick opening uh, comments. I do want to spend this time on the idea of a dharmic economy in Japan because I see a lot of parallels there we could adopt. Mm. Now, a quick personal note about Panditji, Sharmaji, whatever he'd like to be called. Um, there was a time when, when we were setting up the India Pride project and really needed um, some kind of voices or support internationally, especially within the UK from where I think India really desperately needs to reclaim our heritage back. Um, so, as I've said this multiple times, you know, the, the, the one conversation we need to have with former colonies is, look, you took our lives, you took our resources and you took our heritage. Uh, the least you can do is give our heritage back. Um, so, I've known Panditji for the longest time as one of the earliest supporters uh, in the UK. Um, what I'd like you to talk about, sir, is almost as a contents page for the rest of your conversation today, is to talk to the PIO experience and what do you see changing globally when it comes to the global lens on India and to the lens India is beginning to have from an operating point of view with the rest of the world? Um, and like I said, in an individual capacity and in the capacity of someone that organizes uh, India's view um, in the UK. Thank you. That's a wonderful and overly generous introduction, uh, Anuragji. So, we're talking to this notion about a new world order, but we are still talking within the language and framework that the old world order was created in. Now, as members of the diaspora, we have lived within that framework and seen it at first hand. And bearing in mind the paucity of time, I'm going to wrap it up in a very short space. What we are witnessing in the West is the collapse of the order which was based and financed by the slavery and colonialism dividend. That money has gone, it's finished. But whilst they had that asset base, they were able to experiment with all of the isms, whether it's capitalism, socialism, Marxism, etc., etc., etc. And if you pick the Euro-Christian world, those isms, not a single one of them, has demonstrated any sustainability. So we have a slightly different perspective which we can offer them. If you look at the diaspora community, we live in little silo communities generally. 
But we live in dharmic principles. We don't cause suffering to anybody else. We are relatively quiet. We're not uh, obtrusive. We are not obnoxious. We don't push the boundaries. We have got the lowest in terms of criminal activity. In the UK, recent statistics said 0%, even though we're almost 4% of the, the population. And this is reflected everywhere. Everywhere Bharatiyas go, we take a dharmic identity with us and we survive in a dharmic countries with adharmic histories and adharmic principles. In order for us to navigate the future, that experience, I think, is really worth considering. And I would share with you, in terms of the West, it's almost like a train wreck. It is a train, it's a runaway train, it has a huge amount of energy, the speed with which it's moving is very fast, some of the carriages have already caught fire, and it's irrecoverable. It's irrecoverable because the principles upon which they make decisions are completely against human evolution, against peace, against tranquility, against prosperity. They are civilizations built on calm and earth. They are stuck in the calm earth loop. They decide something. Is it going to give me more calm? Yes, it is. Great, we will go ahead and do it. Can I get more earth from this? Yes, let's go and bomb Iraq and steal their oil and their gold. Those are the first two Purshar. As an ancient, ancient civilization, we know the next two, which is Dharma and Moksha. And Dharma and Moksha are the two elements which give us sustainability. Minimum of consumption, minimum of suffering, maximum anand for all jivatmas. And those are the only principles which will allow a society to survive for a long period of time. Thank you, Anuragji. Two minutes. <laughs> Wonderful, sir. Oh, actually two minutes. Um, so, so this is very interesting now. So Ambassador Star talked about the idea of weaponizing, um, whether it's finance or technology or diplomacy or what have you. Uh, Prasenjit ji spoke about complexity and the need for India to reform in internally. <coughs> the need for India to reform internally alongside making diplomatic effort. And, and, and Panditji here spoke about the idea, if I could paraphrase, that our biggest export could actually be a humane view of coexistence with the rest of the world. Now, I would like to throw in a challenge here to each of the panelists. Within these core ideas that you, that you presented, um, what is the one big do and one big do not that we as Indians, uh, what tack would you like most changed? Um, so what are, we, what are we getting wrong which we need to do today? What are we not which we need to stop? Um, Ambassador Saab, you first. <clears throat> and I think the first thing to do is to accept our limitations. Yes, we have ideas how the world should be governed, how society should be governed. We are 1.4 billion, one-fifth, one-sixth of humanity. We have a role to play. But the manner in which this world has been constructed over the last few centuries and the, and the reality of the domination of uh, the West in, in the entire ecosystem uh, that we have is not easy to dilute or, uh, or uh, work against effectively and develop a new notion of how societies uh, should function and what should be the relationship between nations and, uh, uh, and how world uh, governance uh, should be, uh, on what basis it should be constructed. I think first is to realize your limitations. And I say this because what are we at the moment constrained to do even if we don't want to do it? I don't think we don't want to do it, but the reality is what are we looking for? More foreign investment, developing our manufacturing sector with the help of technologies that come, to, come from abroad. All the major initiatives on the global stage, all the major initiatives, including climate change, are coming from the West. And we are responding. We may uh, modify them, tweak them, make sure that our interests are not neglected, but we work within the frameworks that they decide for us. We have not, yes, we've just organized this uh, uh, voice of the Global South Conference, but the South is so terribly divided. Uh, and when push comes to shove, 
uh, the, the South uh, will also try to follow their respective goals and interests, though in a very broad way they may go along with India because India has the voice and capacity uh, to make their uh, concerns known on the world stage. Uh, so, to answer your question very briefly and, and, and in conclusion, uh, I would say that uh, we have constraints. Within those constraints, we are doing reasonably well. And uh, the, fa the fact that the Prime Minister is now talking about human-centric development is precisely what one of our panelists, Panditji, said just now. But the reality is, as we see around us, the West, uh, when it talks so, it's with such double standards and with such hypocrisy about human rights and things like that, they are not going to be dictated by us about how the world should be human-centric. It will be West-centric as much as possible for them to maintain that hegemony. Can, can I ask you a follow-up question? It's a very quick question. So I'm trying to relate this to the world of psychoanalytics and psychology. Now, whenever a client or a patient sits down with a psycho psychologist, the first idea they focus on is radical acceptance. That listen, you, come, you need to come to terms with who you really are, how you have treated others, how you have allowed others to treat you. And on the basis of a genuine, honest understanding, you need to reframe what you can expect from others and cannot. Now that's a view. Another view is perhaps a more idealistic view. One is a as-is view, one is a should-be view. How do we navigate what is versus what should be? Look, we've been uh, criticized for decades that uh, we've been too idealistic. Uh, we should be more realistic. And uh, we try to, you know, uh, be on the high moral horse. And this has been actually criticized as a big uh, defect, deficiency in our uh, thinking processes with regard to how we relate to the world. And, now, and we are told now that, look, you have to basically look after yourself. And when we talk about India becoming more nationalistic, what does it actually mean? Indirectly, this is what it means, that we should actually concentrate how we build up our nation. If we can take the maximum out of the others in terms of achieving that objective, we should uh, do so. But we should have our own vision of how, where we should go and how we should proceed on that path. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we are divided within. Let's be realistic about it. We are divided within. There's no consensus, internal consensus on, on what we should be and what we should push for and how we should expand our interests. I mean, if the government does this or the government does that, there are a whole host of opposition figures uh, who would uh, criticize the government for each and everything. And we give a picture to the outside world, which they exploit because they know there are internal divisions in the country, which they stoke. So they want to make uh, our progress slow down as much as possible, though at another level, they also want us to grow because they, our market is attractive uh, to them. So it's a very complex situation that, 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 that we face. So to answer your question, we are divided. This is what is. And what we should be, this business about Vasudev Kutambangan and all that, uh, up to a point, yes, it's a good philosophy to work on, <laughs> but the reality of world history is that this has never been the basis of relations between people, societies, and nations. And until we become like the United States of America, that we can fashion the world according to our thinking, our desire, our values, it's a huge struggle ahead for us. This is a very interesting segue. So, so we are saying that we are moving from Gandhian or Nehruvian pacifism to now um, a more assertive state. Uh, we perhaps could be a little more assertive. And, and that's a change or evolution we need to go through. Now, speaking about the idea of change at the risk of being facetious, Prasenjit Basu was here day before yesterday in a suit. Yesterday in trousers, shirt and a, and a Modi jacket. And today in a dhoti, kurta uh, and a jacket. So, I haven't seen anyone adopt, adapt to change so quickly within three days. But on a serious note, I, I know you do have a view on, on us needing to get out of uh, the idea of pacifism and yeah. perhaps even Vasudeva, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which I believe is a little controversial to, not controversial, but contrarian 
to the stand India needs or at least is officially taking on paper. So how do we… Okay. So I think the first thing is that uh, absolutely I agree that we need to develop our own strength economically first of all uh, and then once you have economic strength, you have the capacity to develop strategic military strength as well. Uh, but I think we can learn a lot from uh, this gigantic neighbor. You know, if you think about Maoist China, Mao was the greatest genocidal maniac of the 20th century. Uh, and yet, he was embraced by Nixon Kissinger and even by Jimmy Carter. I, of course, after he, you know, uh, uh, Mao was already dead, but his successors was... Were, what were the incentives? Now, Why the trade-off? Yeah. So the, the point is that, first of all, China made itself a nuisance enough of a nuisance for it to be accepted by the rest of the world and to be embraced as a friend to such a degree that China's friend, Pol Pot, the second biggest genocidal maniac of, this, of, this, of the 20th century, who wiped out one third of his people, he was the official, uh, he had the official Cambodian seat in the UN with American support all the way through. So, uh, America supported China in its worldview. Now, we, I think, now have a remarkable conjuncture of, of, of events such that the Indo-Pacific, rather than Asia-Pacific, is the term used uh, for strategic thinking about our region. The fact that Asia-Pacific has been replaced by Indo-Pacific is a huge advance. And now we have the notion of a quad, uh, a four, four member strategic, economic, uh, and perhaps military alliance or pseudo alliance, uh, proto alliance that is beginning to emerge. We need to use this to the hilt uh, to strengthen ourselves economically and also to, uh, to gain strategic space. Now, you know, I think one of the tragedies of the initial years, uh, the 50s and 60s under, ne under the Nehruvians, is that uh, we neglected the military. Uh, we, the fact that we have a Krishna Menon Marg in, in our capital is the greatest disgrace. I mean, this was the man who, who drove us to defeat in 1962. And we have a, have a huge road right in the middle, very close by, named after him. Surely we should remove this, name it after anybody else. Lal Bahadur Shastri, for instance, uh, who, who saved us in 1965. So anyway, now the point is that if we don't have a, we didn't have a strategic thinking, despite the fact that every war that the British fought in Asia from 1839 to 1945, and actually 1946, every war that they fought was fought with the British Indian military. The, so the British Indian military was our inheritance. We let it go to seed. Uh, we had an economy that was the eighth most industrialized in the world, uh, eighth largest manufactured exporter in the world in 1947. Uh, and we have let that go to seed. So now rebuilding is really important. And I, and I think you know, at this point, we are at a stage where we need to rebuild quickly, close the gap between us and the top four economies in the world, and particularly the second largest economy in the world, which is, uh, which is a huge threat. Now, if you just think about that threat, I think it's important when, Mao went to, when Nixon went to meet Mao, you know, Kissinger and Nixon were absolutely gobsmacked by the fact that Mao spent all his time, about half, more than half of the time, talking not about the Soviet Union, but about India. Uh, the fact that India was so central to his worldview as a rival was something that somehow our foreign service never took on board. All you have to do is read Nixon's papers and the Nixon-Kissinger papers, and you see very clearly that India was the strategic threat because we are the only civilization that has survived for 5,000 years, just like the Chinese. And we are seen as a civilizational threat to China. And if we don't understand that, and if we don't make policy uh, on that basis, then we are going to be making mistake after mistake. And I think the first mistake is to have given up Tibet. I mean, I mean, obviously, Tibet is not for us to have given up in the sense that it wasn't ours, but it was part of our civilization. And to have forgotten that is awful. We need to find ways of making Tibet quite central. Now, 
we already have in Ladakh and Arunachal a significant Tibetan, Tibetan linked uh, ethnic uh, population. So we, I think we have the basis to start pushing back against China via Tibet and East Turkestan. I mean, these two are parts, were never part of China throughout the history of China. Uh, and yet, we now have almost come to accept East Turkestan and Tibet as Chinese. What nonsense. Pandiji, question to you. Before the question, would you like to respond to the whole idea of uh, letting go of the era of uh, pacifism or Vasudeva Kutumbakam? Would you hold a different view or would you tend to agree? In principle, I would agree. Um, we have this notion of non-violence, but we have no notion of non-force. We mastered the understanding that force can be used without violence. Arjun is being exhorted to act for the benefit of everybody. He's not being told to become aggressive and go and kill the people in a moment of uh, rage or anything like that we have to reconnect with the notion of the legitimate use of force. And I think that's happening. So that's, that, that's a, an encouraging sign. But there are other encouraging signs. You know, for such a long period of time, the northern hemisphere, it used Bharat and it used China, it used Africa as the whipping posts. The moment it wanted to elevate its uh, government, wanted to elevate its own position in front of its own constituency, its own citizenry, it would drag out the poverty porn from Africa. It would drag out the most terrible pictures from Mumbai, etc. It would drag out and create documentaries such as India's daughters, ignoring the fact that they themselves have a much, much larger problem. That whipping boy has disappeared. There are two aspects now. The world is beginning to connect with Bharat and Hindus and Indians and the indigenous traditions of this country like they have never done so before. If I can share a simple statistic, in the United Kingdom, in one weekend, there were only 750,000 attendees at all of the churches up and down the country. That is a dramatic fall in numbers. Where have those people gone? We know that there are over 3,200 yogacharyas who are yoga practitioners and yoga teachers who are white English women. And so there is a shift that's occurring. And what it's doing is emphasizing that there is some sort of value in our perspectives. We need to become confident about that. Um, Basuji, you mentioned being embraced by Kissinger. Um, and it reminded me of that old adage where Kissinger was remarking that being an enemy of the United States can be a very dangerous thing, but being a friend can actually be fatal. So we shouldn't really take too much confidence from the relationship that the US has had with other countries. The last thing that is hugely different is economies are the activity of the people. The governments tend to be the tail that tinkers around. But when a people rise and want to become aspirational, they want to create, they engage in a dynamic activity. Now, I was in Varanasi not so long ago, and there were two um, students who were from, the, uh, from Belgium. And one of them came to me and she said, she said, since I've been here, I've noticed that in Bharat, everybody is doing something. There is an energy, a dynamism. There is activity going on. And I'd never noticed it before, but in Europe, we seem to have lost it. Now, you will see this in the diaspora community everywhere we go. The diaspora community within one generation stands up on its feet. It educates its children. It creates material wealth. And it's that branch of the, that dynamism that is intrinsic within us. If you look at what's happening in the United States, they have the highest, excuse me, they have the highest number of suicides per capita in the Western Hemisphere. The incidence of mental illness is skyrocketing. How many times do we hear of a young child taking a, an automatic weapon and shooting innocent children and teachers? These are signs of a society whose mind is collapsing inwards. And I hold the governments of the West responsible. Although they have been painting the picture that they are the epitome of democracies, they're not. I call them scam democracies. They have no interest in the well-being of their citizens. They are playing the great game. The British people did not authorize the United Kingdom to use force against Iraq. They were not given the opportunity to do so. 
Jack Straw, who featured in this recent BBC documentary, he completely forged a dossier and then submitted it as evidence of weapons of mass destruction, which never existed. So there is a rift appearing in all of these scam democracies between those who govern and the people themselves. Now, this is a moment of crisis in the West. Those who are historians will remember that the American Civil War was precipitated by a gentleman called Colonel Pratt who rode up and down the West Coast with one phrase. He said, no taxation without representation. In the UK, in the US, the people are saying, why are we paying taxes to you when we have no representation? In the UK, it's become very apparent that the governance, the authorities, they had no concern about those one million plus incidences of criminal rape of those white girls of the low in, lower classes. It was concealed again and again. So we have dynamism on our side, we have energy on our side. What we need is a government which can protect our borders so that every single Bharatiya citizen can expand and become a fully invested member of a democratic dharmic society. Wonderful Panditji. Now we have we have a few minutes to get in a couple of questions. Now, clearly, as you noticed with the diversity of opinions and topics on this panel now, where the world is headed, what the new world order is, and what role India plays in, is, in it is, is a very complex, multifaceted conversation. Um, the idea for this conversation for me is, was to just get us started. But for those of you who want to dig in a little deeper, this may sound like a shameless self-plug, self but I really urge you to buy this book, Modi Shaping a Global Order. Uh, the foreword is by Jay Shankarji, the External Affairs Minister. And it's been compiled by Amb Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, Vijay Chauthaiwale ji, and Uttam Kumar Sinam. Now, why do I recommend this? Um, I, I don't recommend this because I've contributed a chapter to this. I recommend this because you literally have the best of voices who understand India and India's emerging role across technology, military, economics, policy, education, what have you. So those of you who are interested, uh, just released last week by Nadda ji, um, strongly recommend. Now, we have time for a couple of questions. Could I, rec uh, yeah, can, the, can we take the mic to this gentleman on, on the right of the stage in the black t-shirt? Hello, hello. Hi, sir. My question is directed towards ambassador, sir. Uh, so 400 years ago or so, Europeans really went into sea travel, you know, full on into it and they came to India and all that. Once they took money out of India, now when we go to Europe, they say, where's your passport? 400 years ago, there was no such thing. So after taking the money, suddenly they invented this new thing called passport, right? So my question is for the world of today. Today we are working in AI and... As for now, the entire world is working together towards it. What if tomorrow they decide that there's this new border, polytheistic thought and dharmic thought is no longer allowed to... Your you know, question, sir? Yeah. Yeah. This, this. Okay. So, so this new sea of AI... Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a how... sentence that ends with a question mark. Yes, sir. So okay. what's your view? How cognizant we need to be about this new passport that would be invented in the future blocking us from the new, this, this era of AI? That's the question, sir. Ambassador. I think uh, it's a very hypothetical question. Yes, artificial intelligence uh, is being developed. There are two views about it. Uh, there are a lot of concerns uh, about the impact of artificial in intelligence on society in general, on human uh, relationships, on all aspects uh, of our life. So the last word has, has not been said, but in many other ways it can uh, facilitate many things, including some of the worst things <laughs> that one can think of. But anyway, uh, I, I think uh, it's not possible any longer uh, for the West to, to devise a way of uh, relating to each other as nations and creating barriers uh, because power in the world has got diffused. Now, let's say that the major powers of the world got together, United States, Europe, China, Russia, India, and then decided uh, that this is the way down we should go. But I can't think of any consensus developing in this regard. On the contrary, 
they are now serious, there's serious competition uh, between US and China, uh, for instance, in terms of who gains ascendancy in this sector in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, research and the new modes of uh, uh, functioning and this and that. So I don't think that uh, this question uh, is uh, today topical, though of course, you one can always keep thinking about it, reflecting on it, and see what would be the various uh, dimensions of it. But there is, to conclude, there is absolutely no way that anything that can be constructed without India's participation and consent. So I, I won't be too worried about this. You know, just, just on a lighter note, as much as I trust artificial intelligence, sir, I trust human stupidity a little more. And, and with the fan following that Kim Kardashian has, and when I look at the sales of McDonald's uh, as, as the choice of nutrition, um, I, I do see uh, some parts of the world headed in a bit of a self-destruct mode, and who knows, that might be India's opportunity. Pandit you want to come in with the quick? Ji, it's a very contemporary question, and I just wanted to toss in the notion that the nation which has instigated 80 military interventions in the last few decades, the nation, the nation that has been at war with itself ever since its foundation, the nation that entered into 400 plus treaties with the indigenous people of America has enshrined its wisdom into silicon. Now I would suggest that that's not artificial intelligence, although they would call it that. I think it's better named as artificial stupidity. We have a long way to go before we can replicate the intuition which exists inside of a human being. There are times when we all make decisions which purely logically do not give us benefit. There are times when we choose to defer something just because of a gut feel. There are times when we respond to somebody because of the million signals that we get from them and that we get a feeling for them. None of those can be enshrined in artificial intelligence. And so please recognize that it is a runaway train, it is artificial stupidity, and humanity has got a long way to go before it can control this potential monster. Mm. If I could just uh, put in a little Very plug here. Presenters. Slightly yeah, different yeah. view here. Yeah, quick view. Uh, and that is that, uh, you know, I, I fully understand that the Americans have been a genocidal nation and so on. But at this point, uh, I think it is in our national interest to be aligned with America rather than with China because our immediate threat is far greater. Uh, we, have a, we have a serious threat from China. And to the extent that we can, we need to be aligned with America without, without being foolish about it. We're not going to be, you know, I, so the stance we've taken on Russia, for instance, is absolutely right. We're an, we have a relationship with Russia that is longstanding. But on most other questions, America and us are together, and particularly when it, when it, when it has to do with the Indo-Pacific and taking. Asia and, and the Quad. Sorry, uh, I, here's what I want to do. We literally have two minutes. Sir. I'd like to get in a question from the gentleman in the black T-shirt and then the gentleman in the, in the green shirt. And I'm afraid after that, you'll, you'll have to you know, catch up pa panelists offline and have a conversation with them. But again, quick question, and who is it directed to? Let's uh, club both the questions together. So my question is to sir, when you spoke of uh, Japanese which, economy being... Which sir? Uh, Prasenjit sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So when you spoke of the Japanese economy being closer to a dharmic economy, their social system being closer to one that we should have had. So uh, are there any primary sources that you can, uh, you know, just talk about that made you say that or made you think that so that we can even refer to those while thinking of a dharmic state ourselves? Well, uh, if you want an Bharatiya example, I would say that the Marathas were the closest thing to a dharmic state that we can think of in, in recent history. But they didn't have long enough to establish that dharmic state. So the point about Japan is that basically Japan has a, social, has a society and an economy that is fundamentally Japanese can you recommend uh, a source, though, so, oh, so source. they could pick it up? So I think his question was, what book or source can, uh, can they refer to? Any, I mean, uh, there, there, there's a book by, uh, a, by a, a social philosopher called Murakami. Uh, uh, and that's, that's probably the, the best example. I mean, he, he basically... Uh, this is not the Murakami. And can I also plug in your book, if you don't mind? Not, yeah. not, not, a, not a plug in for a friend, but genuinely. Yes. 
if you haven't read Asia Reborn as yet, um, please do. Uh, you know, it's 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 Prasanjit's, you know, sweat and blood for many years. But not, don't read it because of that. It it really helps you look at Asia with a very new lens. It helps you reframe Asia from a from an Asian point of view, not from a Western point of view, which which we've been exposed to in the past. So I think that you would find very helpful. Just a quick comment on this question. One is that Japan is a very homogenous society, uh, which we are not. Secondly, if you see the state of the Japanese economy today, uh, they are in serious difficulty. They have been stagnating now for the last about three decades or so. It has, it, it has aged so much as a people that uh, their population is going to decline in the next couple of decades or whenever to 80 million from the present uh, uh, level of uh, population that they have. Uh, then it's an economy because it's a small, although it has 110, 120 million people, but it's highly dependent uh, on China next door. Very vital for them is their biggest uh, trade partner. So I, I don't think the Japanese model, apart from what you rightly said uh, in terms of uh, full employment, uh, even that is changing, but yes, if you join the company, then for, ever, for all your life you were employed by the company, they will not, uh, it's not hire and fire as it is in the Western capitalist, especially American system. So yes, there are aspects of it, but there are some vital differences. Yeah, gentlemen in the green shirt, please, you please ask the question. I will choose who to direct it to because we're already out of time. Sir, my question is to uh, simple, sir. Is India eyeing on veto rights? And if yes, then how it will achieve? And second question, uh, where is African representation in UN Council? Yeah, so is India eyeing for veto rights? Oh. And is there African representation in the, in the Council? Well, first of all, Africa can't make up its mind. They want uh, two seats in the UN Security Council, and they can't decide whether it should be South Africa and Nigeria, because Egypt has also put its uh, hat in the ring. So unless they, such, they decide, uh, it will not move forward. Number two, there is a huge resistance uh, to any other permanent member, if it happens, acquiring veto power, because veto has actually been the bane of the UN Security Council. So we will not get support, even from those who want us to be a permanent member, if he said that we would like to be a full permanent member, not a diluted permanent member, uh, with veto rights. It won't fly. Any chances? No. Yes. Um in this new Wait, world questions. order that we're thinking of, it's very possible that as America's decline becomes more violent and it starts to implode at a greater rate, that there could be a wonderful relationship between Africa and Bharat. An African-Bharat relationship would change the nature of human affairs on the planet. And it's so natural, I think it's so obvious that it needs to happen. We just need a little bit of political will and vision to spark that process. The gentleman over there asked about passports, and uh, Ambassador G responded to boundaries. But remember, the Americans only two days ago were producing social media material to influence the Nigeria election. Our Bharatiya people, we should recognize that there are no boundaries left. This is a global world. The Kurukshetra is everywhere. The Dharam Yod is being fought everywhere. And we have got the one secret to sustainability. Everything that we do is to secure Anand. And we understood how to get Anand with Tyag and with Moksha. The highest Anand that a human being can experience is zero consumption. And isn't that the ideal formula for global sustainability? That's what we have to share with them. Wonderful, Panditji. Now, I, ju I just realized one thing while I was sitting here. Um, the hypocrisy in myself, sir. I was on the earlier panel with Smriti Raniji on gender equality. Uh, and here I am running a manual. So what I'd like to do is to break that a little bit by giving a lady a chance to ask uh, a question. Uh, please, please bring in a perspective which is very diverse from the, from the old men you see on stage. Oh, sir. <laughs> uh, sir, my question is very simple. The panel was talking about the weaponization of uh, finance, the sanctions. My question is, uh, in US, what is more powerful, the economic sanctions or the weapon industry, or in simple words, the Pentagon? I would like to know who is more powerful, the Pentagon 
or the sanctions? Well, you know, uh, since the uh, U.S. is the biggest economy in the world and the dollar is a reserve currency, so uh, in terms of uh, weaponizing finance, the United States is uh, placed in, in a way in which it can impose its will on others. And it's doing so successfully. After all, they succeeded in breaking entirely our oil ties with Iran. Even in areas where uh, sanctions do not exclude certain humanitarian things, uh, our companies are very hesitant to go into those areas because the sanctions laws of the United States are so complex that the banks and the private sector don't want to fall afoul of them. It's a very, very powerful tool that they have in, have in their hand. Though, mind you, they have not succeeded fully in, in, uh, in their sanctions uh, policies, repeated sanctions on, on Russia, for instance, but Russia is suffering. Insofar as the, the Pentagon is concerned, that is the, un, that is the other uh, handle that the, or weapon that the United States has in, in terms of their global dominance. They have hundreds of military bases all around the world, hundreds. And their defense budget is over $800 billion. It is larger than the next 10 countries, their defense uh, budgets combined. This gives them enormous power. They know that US preeminence in the world rests on two things, the dollar and the military industrial complex. Wonderful, sir, wonderful. Th thank you all. Thank you all for, for participating and shedding these lights. Thank you audience again uh, for, for bearing with us despite this heat.